Okay, so it takes me, it's a great pleasure to welcome you this evening to this talk from the Leicestershire Archaeological and Historical Society. Our speaker this evening is my colleague Steve Baker from University of Leicester Archaeological Services. Steve is a project officer at ULAS. He's worked for the University of Leicester since 2003, has supervised many large multi-period excavations across the region, has worked on Richard III project, has most recently though been directing the archaeological excavations connected with the Leicester waterside redevelopment and that is what he is here to talk about this evening. So Steve, welcome to Leicestershire Archaeological and Historical Society. Thank you very much Matt. Um, I shall share my uh, screen. You're good. Is that good? You're good. Not yeah. muted me. That's good. No, you're fine. Um, well, I'm not going to go over what Matt's just said. He's uh, he's just pretty much uh, predicted my first uh, set of notes. Uh, I'm Stephen Baker, um, and I directed. Um, the large-scale waterside excavations. Um, the field work taking place from 2017 to 2019, June. Um, and since then, apart from a, a slight hiatus um, in proceedings due to the um, pandemic, um, from 2019 until now and ongoing with the post-excavation. Um, it's a massive site. Um, so what I hope to give you today is an overview um, or an introduction to those who know nothing about it um, in all aspects, an overview of all aspects of a, a large scale and as Matt said a complex urban um, and specifically commercial um, excavation um, and you'll see as we go through it that perhaps uh, um, at this stage we have more um, questions arising than, and theories um, than answers. So where are we? For those that don't know, or are not nearby, we're in Leicestershire on the left, um, and Leicester on the right. Um, I'm going to use my uh, fancy laser now. Um, so the site, it's about half a mile north of the uh, present city centre of Leicester. This is the centre of Leicester. Um, for those that know Leicester, this is the uh, big shopping centre, the High Cross. This is the Ring Road. The site lies uh, bordered by the River Saw to the west and the canal, the Grand Union Canal to the north. Um, this street here, which is pivotal to the um, excavations is Northgates, runs through Frog, Frog Island, um, an area of Victorian factories and later that's, that's subsequently been demolished as part of this development. Um, very briefly, we've done a lot of work a decade ago or so um, in the shopping centre um, and the car parks on the north of the Ring Road. More recently, we've done a lot of work on the east bank of the River Saw. Um, Bath Lane, the Stibby site where the uh, fantastic mosaic came from um, in 2017-18 and we've done some work in High Cross so we have got um, archaeology surrounding um, the site. This will come up again and again, the site's divided by the line of the city wall, the historic city wall. So that's where it falls in a Roman Leicester, uh, the northwest corner of the city. Um, again, about half a mile from the centre of Roman Leicester, it's been the forum. Um, I don't want to dwell on this slide too long, but just note that here's a city grid, the Roman city grid, and that was established uh, between 100 and 120 AD, although I was talking to someone and debate and he thought it was 90 AD today. We didn't we didn't argue for long over 10 years. So it certainly didn't go over that up overnight. So um the site medieval Leicester 
again, dominated by the defences, defences being a landmark through that, that, that period from Roman Leicester um, to medieval Leicester. Of note, really, on this slide and relevant to the site is this area, the northwest corner of the, uh, the medieval city, um, from documentary sources, we know it was the site or thereabouts of the Blackfriars from the late 13th century. Um, and that's pivotal to the, some of the finds we've uh, discovered here. This is an old slide, I've left it in. It's, it's always good to have a few facts, isn't it? So we'll go through them in a minute. But more importantly, this, this sort of focuses in on where the, the archaeology is. The blue lines um, are evaluation trenches. Um, and, and where you've got green background um, uh, under them blue lines, that's essentially areas of the development that were investigated um, by evaluation trench. Um, and deemed really to be um, to have less potential for, for archaeology that was going to be impacted upon by the development. Um, and as a result, um, a mitigation work um, was different there. Um, and it was basically downgraded. This could be to the depth of the archaeology, the nature of the archaeology, um, or, or in, in, in respect of the, um, the levels that were, were going to be disturbed over there. Um, some of it was subject to continued uh, watching briefs, which I'll come to later, um, and further evaluation. But essentially, it was less important. And it was probably open land in, in a lot of the periods we're looking at. Um, basic facts, then. There were 41 of those evaluation trenches, um, the excavation, the development area, 13 acres altogether. It's massive. Um, and the principal areas of excavation, um, 1.25 acres. Um, the watching briefs are actually still ongoing. We're up to number 19. Um, we have still got some work to do. When we do that, we don't know. Um, and I think we had a so total staff team of archaeologists up to 48 over the, the time on site. Um, and at one point, when this was covered in buildings, uh, any given day, um, I could get to work and I'd, I'd, I'd have to sort through 30 keys and, and, and work out which of the 16 gates that they fitted. Um, often that was delegated, actually. So. Evaluation trench quickly. Um, generally, the idea is to evaluate an area. Um, and by evaluation, we mean to characterise what, what remains there in terms of how what date they are. Are they Roman, medieval, prehistoric? What depth they um, lie at, at the archaeological horizon? Um, the level of preservation? the type of deposits um, and also the thickness of the, the archaeological deposits and, and, and where the bottom is to give an idea of the, the time it's going to take to, to deal with these. Again, due to the scale of the site, it didn't work, really work like that. Um, we were evaluating areas while we were excavating other areas. Um, things caught up and overtook each other. Um, so there was never really that, um, that, that definition between between the two, and like I say, we're still um, uh, we're still running watching brief investigations now. Um, watching briefs very briefly, uh, a, a mitigation stage, perhaps after we've done the main excavations and done the evaluation, uh, and they may be just rather than us taking the lead in, in excavations, it might be um, the developer, the people who are building, and, and they may be digging drainage. We've got an example later, and we might just go along to watch and stop them if, if uh, remains um, turn up that we deem need excavating and recording. Um, so it's usually towards the end of um, the excavations. Um, so whenever we go to a site, whatever size it is, we, we, we usually have some sort of idea um, of what could be there. And they're sort of formalized in these research aims. Often the first step in them is a, a desk-based assessment um, where they'll be drawn together um, and it gives us an idea of what to expect and that can draw from documentary sources um, and old maps, previous archaeological work like we saw on the other slide and what was found there and they also tie into to research frameworks um, which can be na local, national or even international um, research frameworks. Um, 
obviously there's a, a scenario where you're digging a hole in the ground you don't know what's there you can plan for it but you can be surprised um, and as a result of that um, we were very open to new um, updated research aims as, the, as any excavation progresses so very briefly the ones at waterside well we knew where the, the town defenses would run through the site so that formed one of our principal um, research aims and the effect that that has on the Roman town because the defences going around the town what's at the periphery of that town before they go around that was one of the main aims um, from documentary sources we knew that there was a, a northern sub medieval suburb extending along that Northgate street um, we'd never really seen it in, a, in any great extent archaeologically we have in the south suburb um, around the magazine around that area of Leicester but never in the north we were never quite sure the course of the river saw um, and like I mentioned in that other slide we don't know an awful amount about the Blackfriars and um, um, the buildings there so that excavation happened um, and our main surprises not necessarily that we had a cemetery but it was the the format cemetery took um, a collection of a high proportion of them being mass graves um, we did find the, the northern suburb as you will see um, and, and perhaps a, an extra updated research aim there was this discovery um, of a northern and quite extensive tanning industry um, that formed these updated um, project aims briefly for those that don't know um, urban archaeology well it's principally looking for buildings it is tend to be made of buildings that hasn't really changed for quite a long time so we pretty much know people were living in Leicester from you know from the the, the Roman period and before um, and it's a safe bet that they were living in buildings and buildings haven't really changed either um, essentially they're walls and floors and uh, and they have roofs um, we don't really find the roofs because we're archaeologists they tend to have gone um, at least in we don't find the roofs in situ um, and also a building whether it's 2000 years ago um, not only does it have walls and floors but it also has a, a pretty typical lifespan in that it's built it's constructed it's used uh, and then it at some point it falls into disuse and essentially that's what we're looking for we're looking for buildings um, it sounds simple it's not always that simple but it's a good place to start so the principal areas of excavation these fall inside I should have put the line of the wall on but you'll remember by the time we end um, the principal areas of excavation inside and outside the, uh, the town wall um, and now these are based on the footprints of the buildings that are going to be constructed and some have been already but these you'll notice are a bit bigger these are commercial properties along the main road and, and this is housing this is a mixture of housing and, and commercial but these were the commercial ones along the, the frontage um, I'm going to look at each area and give you a, a summary of what we found um, but just so we can get started area A um, in the south of area A near the line of the city wall um, we got a large high status Roman building um, towards the north we got some medieval structures set out back from the, the, the street frontage um, and some backyard activity associated with buildings that would have been on the street frontage area F um, likewise more medieval buildings but closer to the, the street frontage um, arranged in plots extending back from the street frontage and in them plots evidence for the activity for industrial um, workings going on um, and domestic um, activity that we may be able to relate to the buildings uh, um, on the frontage um, like so we'll, we'll do it in more detail as we go areas C, D and E footprints of uh, uh, terraced housing that's going to go in um, subject to more sample excavation but essentially Roman archaeology in a road in area C um, an ex a projection of that in, in area D and E um, and area B um, is predominantly where we found um, evidence for the cemetery um, on the north of C, D and E and to the west of B we got evidence uh, for the 
the defensive network, the, the ditch, town ditch and the town wall. Um, so starting, makes sense to start with area A, or then we do, although then we do go to F. So, but area A, this is um, along North Gates, uh, the corner between North Gates and Saw Lane. Um, the projected town of the wall um, is just off the corner of this 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 slide, and um, probably where Saw Lane is. You're in ditch. In fact, I know we're in the town ditch there because we did do a watching brief um, early this year. Um, and we're going down meters, the, di the ditch is very deep. Um, the striped areas, they're modern truncation, uh, noticeably along the, the, the frontage here, suspiciously recovering crisp packets dated into the 1990s there. So um, I suspect it was a, well, we don't want to suspect too much, but um, I suspect that was the, the demolition of the uh, the Victorian commercial properties, the terrace properties along along the street front there. But these are the uniform truncations. When, what I mean by truncation is a modern disturbance. These are actually the uh, uh, the very well built. I have got some pictures of them as we go through. Some I'll try and point them out as we get there. Um, the very well built with engineering big, uh, abutments for the Great Central Railway viaduct, the station of which lies immediately south of the bridge over Saw Lane yeah so they were not going to be moved the developer did want to move them until they saw them and then changed their mind um just focus on the south this picture this is a high status uh, Roman building it's either uh, outside the city wall or it predates the city wall either of which um is important to to, to research um in Leicester and the development of the town um the question being whether it was a, a building that predated the wall and was demolished so the defenses could be built um in which case it gives us some firmer evidence and tightens the date that the, the defenses may have been constructed or it's outside the wall and important as itself because why would you have a high status building outside the the wall it's made of um, two surviving floors in these rooms. Um, so it's like one, two, three, there is a wall here, four, five rooms, the western one being a, um, a, an apse. Um, that's a photograph of it mid excavation. Um, granite walls, granite external wall to the north, um, opus and concrete. Roman concrete floors, um, a, a partition wall, an internal partition wall between those two rooms made of clay. And like I say, it was five, um, five rooms in that wing. Um, and again, the question is whether it's outside the defences um, or pre-defences. Um, unfortunately, we didn't see any evidence of the ditch um, uh, before we hit the, the limit of excavation. Spot date so far, and that's as far as we've got with the dating, because um, you know we're in that at that stage of the um the analysis point to it being no later than the um the mid second century so this certainly fits in well with it being before the dense uh, defenses being constructed which the current thinking puts at about 190 ad so this building it looks like it was requisitioned and poultry purchase ordered something like that but demolished in order to make way for the um for the development of the town um Strangely, not dissimilar to what happened to a lot of the buildings there in order to build these com new commercial properties. Um, so that's a possibility. And it fits into that, that research um, about urban development in Leicester and what was going on um, when the defences went in. That's it in, uh, during excavation, um, after the floors have come off, each layer taken off individually and recorded. Um, this is what we sometimes come off site with. So that's that building in digital form. Each line of that um, diagram represents a layer that's been taken off individually um, by the archaeologists. Um, and part of the post ex process is to disentangle um, all those lines and date them um, and then build a matrix of that building, which is essentially, um, I guess, a tool that we use to represent the sequence 
of that building being constructed um, and, and the different phases that go into that construction. Um, and that's hel that helps us to build up um, a narrative of the site um, and date the site. Um, it can get very complicated, especially in urban archaeology at the moment. This, this is at the moment sometimes taking over the more traditional um, techniques of drawing. Um, maybe before in the past, all those different lines and layers would have been drawn separately by archaeologists. It has its pros and cons, but we are moving into digital, digital age and, and, and archaeology is no exception there. Um, there is a transitional process that we're probably in at the moment. Okay. Um, okay, this is um, the same area. It's the medieval period. The green circular bits here, pits, medieval pits, some cutting through the layers of that, the, the Roman layers of that building to the south. Um, but really, I just want to focus on these brown areas, notably this one at the top, which is building 21. Can you see that on your, yeah, building 21, 26. Um, and then here, um, structure 22 and 23. Um, the brown areas are the surviving floors. So here in building 21, we've got a, a medieval building surviving, but notice it's set back from um, the front. This, this wouldn't be right on the, the medieval street frontage. We think the medieval street frontage was probably about five metres to the um, east of this, this line. So you're looking at a, a property away from, from the front, which again gives us opportunity to see what's happening back away from the street. Um, and this is um, an, an area of structures, not necessarily um, a building, um, but perhaps representing some industrial activity in the backyards, which is what we want to see really. Um, This is at building 26, so this is looking towards um, towards North Gates. Um, the pottery so far dates this to between 1250 and 1400, so it falls within the medieval period, and it's fantastic survival. A quick comparison um, to that building, which that was Roman building we saw, where uh, the layers that go into the, the construction of it are perhaps like 50 up to 70 centimetres thick. And that probably represents a, a period of 150 whatever years. Um, a similar period is it could be represented by this building, um, but the layers that go into the construction of this could be less than 10 centimetres. There was a big change in, in um, the quality of buildings when um at the end of the roman empire and into the medieval period um so this plaster floor is literally millimeters thick and these buildings were often made whereas in the roman period you could the organization was there to bring in materials stone um construct um things out of concrete in the medieval period a lot of these these buildings were just made um from materials that were locally available a mishmash of them whatever was there at the time um and as a result they, they rare, rarely survive in this this level, um, um, at least uh, that we've seen in Leicester. So you've got a plaster floor here. You can see an internal partition of stair holes, tiny stair holes. Um, in about the middle of the shot, we've got a clear wall dividing these two areas into two different rooms um, and two walls either side running east to west, um, giving us essentially um, one, two, three, four rooms. This was an external wall. We did think we had some sort of threshold here, whether it's a, a doorway or, or there was talk on site. Uh, I don't know if we we're getting a bit carried away about a staircase, um, but there was certainly a worn area in the plaster here. So some sort of threshold. Um, it's always difficult to, to work out in any building that's been flattened, um, whether it had more than one floor. What was remarkable about the survival of this building is in this room, and you can see the impressions. Um, I did have some better pictures, but you'll have to take my word for it because um, I've not put one in the, the presentation. That we've got surviving floorboards here, which uh, I've not really seen in a building this, this from Leicester um, of that age before. So fantastic survival. Um, we don't get many finds from these buildings. 
but that did come from near it. I apologise. We haven't got many pictures of fines. All my fines have gone to the fine specialists, and I haven't got an enormous amount of photographs of them. Um, we didn't take that many on site, so I do apologise for that. Um, it's going to be a bit scant in, in, in fines to see. But this was a little um, thing that came from near that building. We think it's some sort of seal or a, like a, a button mould. Um, we were debating what it did say. There was some debate whether it actually said Christ here. Um, but we've not got any further with that. And we were a bit puzzled why um, there was a hole in this here. But we, we are producing fines. Um, and, and hopefully there's going to be more news um, about that at some point. This is the building, to, the structure to the south of that. And this is what we're really looking for, because this area is fine as rich. The, the issue with houses and buildings, um, as the one you've seen previously, they don't produce fines, um, um, or at least rubbish, because essentially that's what we're looking for. I mean, if I went to look around your house, I probably wouldn't find, well, I might find a lot of rubbish lying around. But essentially, you clean up your house, um, you sweep it out, um, and, and you throw your rubbish elsewhere. In the medieval period, you're probably not going to get it picked up by a bin man and taken that far out of the town. So it probably ends up, you know, not far away. And the nearest not far away bit is usually in the backyard. So this is why the backyards of these uh, properties are important, because people throw the rubbish there. The key thing about archaeology in the backyard is to be able to link that to a building on the on the frontage, unless, of course, someone's thrown the rubbish over the wall. But so with this backyard area here, this consisted of um, surfaces, you can see here, we did have some uh, stone constructed drains, we've got a wall running uh, north south, behind Sue, who's the excavator here, um, on the other side of this uh, evaluation trench, and there were a series of um, external ovens made of stone, um, industrial, maybe domestic, um, and some more pits. But this is what produces the finds. So the key in urban archaeology, especially medieval archaeology, if you can tie these outdoor um, activities to a building, um, um, that's a bonus. And then you can start um, having an attempt to, to, to say that the, perhaps the people you know, whose backyard this is um, were living in this house. Um, so associating these um, plots and backyard activities with properties is the key thing. Um, which we were able to do more in area F, which is basically further up the street. Um, and here, if you look at the brown areas, we get floors of medieval buildings, very close to the street frontage. You know, we think about five meters further from this line. So you're probably looking at buildings, the rear of buildings, on the frontage. Um, not only that, you see that you do have properties and floors extending back from the frontage. We have properties away from the frontage, so in the backyard areas, like in the previous building. Um, and you also have these walls running across the site, these, these dark areas are the walls, there's more robbed walls. So what we've, and we've also got pits, but they've been divided up into plots. So for example, these pits here, producing fines, a cesspit here, industrial activity, you can start linking these and what's found in them to the buildings on the frontage and start building up theories um, and ideas about, um, who was working in the backyards, presumably living um, in the corresponding buildings on the frontage. Um, in the south, this area, um, a group of a cluster of pits representing the tanning industry. Um, so it's an industrial area of the town. Um, and I'll speak a bit about the, the tanning industry later. Just focus on this building one and two. That's looking from the, the north gates is, is, is down here. Um, a series of floor layers, these dark areas here, um, are internal floors, trampled, just thrown down, trampled, and uh, they've been perhaps divided with partition, um, partitions like we saw in that other building. We excavated several hearths here, uh, which we've sampled. There's a clay, 
dividing wall here um, where George is um, excavating here. Um, at this phase of the building, and this is this was covered with uh, external surfaces, metal surfaces. There was evidence this building was, and, and it's, it probably applies to a lot of the buildings. This is what we, we will start picking apart now. It, it underwent a lot of alterations in its lifetime. It was maybe extended. Um, we know this building was actually condensed and made smaller. Um, in a later phase, this was actually internal as well. George has taken off the floors and it became an external area. So they don't only get bigger, they also get they also get smaller. Um, and all this is feeding into that research um, about this is the first real evidence of us, archaeological evidence um, for the documented northern suburb and the actual nature of it. Um, this is probably the dullest picture I've got. Uh, actually, well, the next one's quite dull too. You, you can be the judge of that. I did look for a more exciting picture of the tanning pits um, with a person in, but I didn't find them, so we'll have to uh, scout over this quick. But these are basically dated to uh, late med tanning pits. Now, the main difference between a pit you're going to throw your rubbish in uh, and a pit that has a function is you're going to spend more time. So you see this this clay, this red clay. This has been lined. This, the, the pits have been lined with this. Um, I, I don't know anyone who's going to throw the rubbish into a pit and line it before. They may have been used as rubbish pits once the function um, was over as convenient places for disposal. But these are typical uh, of, um, of, of industrial pits that have a function. Um, mainly rectangular. These ones are circular, some rectangular ones here. Um, full of articulated animal remains, uh, complete horses, uh, sh complete sheep, um, complete bits and pieces of horses and sheep, the legs. We had disposal pits full of horn cores. Um, There's a fantastic assemblage of, of, of animal bone um, uh, that we started to undergo uh, analysis now. Lots of processes in the tanning industry. Um, I'm not going to profess to know them all now, but there's a skinning, there's areas for storage, um, cleaning, dehairing. And a lot of these processes use um, different products and different ingredients. Um, we've taken a lot of samples from these pits and there are scientific methods that we can pursue to try and uh, determine which pits were, were, were for this, this part of the, the, the process and, and, and which for another. Um, and again, that's going to be part of the, the upcoming work that we're doing. Whatever was happening here, what we do know um, from the tanning industry is it probably stank around here. Um, and again, is that information about who's living in this area? It might not be an area you choose to live in um, out of choice. So it might be that um, it, it points to people who live uh, in, in the buildings near, um, maybe being connected to the, to the tan industry, certainly the people um, that we can associate these pits with um, in the south of that area. Yep, that's the second slightly dull one, but it's not that dull because it's got it's quite exciting survival of um, the, the hoops and the staves of, of whatever was set in there um, from other sites, uh, sites in Northampton. We know there was um, barrels or probably correct on his tubs that were put in there and it's, it's good to have the survival of the, um, the hoops in there. Um, quick slide, this was what was going on around us. It's not like a, this is a commercial excavation in the middle of a city. Um, when we were there, there was lots of buildings there. When we left, there was no, well, there was one building left, I think. Um, the, the uh, what's it called? The, the Leicestershire Wildlife Trust. They, for some reason, they, 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 were, they came through it unscathed. Um, but it's just really to show you the conditions we, we're working on. It's not an idyllic sort of rural location by a stream with like the birds singing and the, the sound of the, the trowel gently scraping, you know, a nice mosaic in, in the foreground. It's, it's a dangerous environment and, 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 and the archaeologists and the team are highly trained um, and very professional. Um, and there's a lot of um, rigorous health and safety um, uh, risk assessments and, 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 and protocols and procedures to, to follow. Um, and this is, you know, it's, it's a daily, a daily thing. Um, I like that shot. It just shows you the destruction of some things. For those who are not low, that know Leicester, this is the, the, the petrol tank from a f a petrol forecourt that was on Northgate. It's just south of the canal. Um, the archaeological level, so where these medieval buildings are, it's about here. You can see that the, 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 there's just no chance of any archaeology. Um, to be left here and, and, and north of area f this was uh, 
quite widespread destruction. But this is a 25 ton excavator um, and, and it's a massive thing to remove. And, and it's, this is part of a watching brief just to check that there's nothing there. I actually bumped into the, uh, to someone who works for a uh, plant hire and his dad worked at this um, petrol station. Um, so he wanted some photos of this. He was more interested in that than the archaeology, actually. Um, there were some tragic consequences to the de demolition, and one was Mandy's snack bar, which has served you last for many years, really, for about six years now. Um, but it also ended up like that. In fact, there's the, I don't know, there's the, the one stool that, that there was, you used to queue up, and then when you got to the stool, you'd sit down and then, around there anyway we don't want to go on too much about that um all right i'm moving inside the town now so again you could have done with a picture of the the, the wall here um you have to do without one um we're going to look at area c d and e south of the, the development area within the town walls um now this area was generally limited to it, limited in excavation or more limited in excavation due to the the groundworks the design for the buildings um sometimes the redesign after discussions with us but principally what we've got here um inside the walls um the walls being here this is the line of the town wall um we've got a roman road identified in the corner between b and c we can project that through. We also found it, picked it up in area D. Either side of the road, ignore the grey area, that's medieval pitting. We have either side of the road, unsurprisingly, we've got quite high status masonry buildings, um, mid Roman day, and to the, the west of the road as well. Um, most of this Roman archaeology lay beneath the lowest point that the uh, developers were going to disturb. But we did have um, a, a remit based on, on uh, discussions with Leicester City Council um, in line with the, the, the research aims um, and, and some areas we concentrate on. These orange areas here. This northern one was an area of, of Roman industrial activity, structures with, with hearths rammed full of, uh, of Roman pottery. And the key thing about this is it lay directly beneath the rampart, the rampart being part of the defences. Um, so it was pre-defences. And again, that feeds into this idea of, of, of what's happening to the town um, immediately before the, the, the defences go in. And, and we do have a, a, a lot less information about um, early Roman Leicester um, than later Roman Leicester, not least because later Roman Leicester probably uh, gets rid of a lot of the earlier evidence. So we, we did some some more constant focused excavation in this area. This was an area that we got a good handle of, mainly because nobody told me to stop because I didn't know the levels at that stage. Um, west of the road, these purple areas are Roman floors. Um, and due to the level at the higher survival of those Roman floors, we were able to excavate in, in these two areas. And as you'll see, we, we are managed to, we will manage to link these buildings up. So that was a, with, a, with limited excavation, uh, we got a, a greater proportion of, of, of information than, than we would expect. Um, anything else about that slide? We also did the work on the, the alignment of the defences. So talking about the defences, the green areas uh, is where we identified the town ditch. Um, the defences basically made up, well, we think, the thinking is about 180 AD, they were probably um, constructed initially as a ditch, you dig a ditch, a series of ditches, and the, 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 the upturn of that becomes the banks and the rampart, the rampart being inside the wall, um, the banks outside into ditches. Um, initially, it would have had a timber palisade before the, 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 the masonry one was built. Um, whatever it was, even at that stage, it would have had a major impact. It would have really changed Leicester. I um, mean, it was a massive physical boundary. Well, not just a physical boundary, but a, 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 a psychological boundary between. I mean, before that, there's not really a, an inside the town and an outside the town. Um, so it would have had a massive impact um, between intramural and extramural activities. Um, 
the ditch um, was actually open and, and, and visible as late as 1844. And we do have a little bit of, of circumstantial evidence for that, which we'll, we'll come to in a later slide. Um, I do think here that the, the west of the defences follows the line of the river. We didn't really know that. So um, again, this is feeding into that research Emma, about what was going on with the defences in this northwest corner of the, um, the town. It's very difficult in the limited um, glimpses we got on this site of, of, of what was how, how to, to date or, or separate the sequence of the, the defences, mainly due to the size. And they undergo, you know, they're visible in 1844, they've, they've undergone uh, several thousand years of alterations, re-digging, um, so it's not something that, that we, we felt we, we could get. So I think the information we have got with the realignment um, has been fantastic. Um, just note this, I'll come to that little uh, grey rectangular area there. Here's an idea of the defence. This is, this is me with, that's not even a hat because that was airbrushed in. I got into trouble for that. Sort of thing. I just said don't use it, but anyway, it's about 10 years ago. In fact, it's more than that now, which is worrying. This is along Sandbergate, so just um, east, east of the site, Sandbergate's um, to the right of the, the picture, this one's parallel. These are the medieval ditches, just to give you an idea of the scale. I think there's about four or five ditches, and they probably still extend this way. And just in this top corner um, was actually a bit of a collapsed wall that's collapsed onto its face. Um, so that gives you an idea of the scale of the, the later masonry wall anyway. I think that's still visible. It's probably grown covered in weeds now or something. And I think they've put it somewhere around the back by the building. So that little dark area, I show that little um, area is this collapsed wall that's in, in area um, B. Now this is a wall, an early Roman boundary wall that it's been pushed over. That's not been robbed gradually, it's been pushed over. Um, again, what lies directly on top of that was the rampart. So again, this has been pushed up, maybe on a, a municipal level, an organised level, to make way for the defences. There's nothing between that and, and, and the rampart. That sort of scale of uh, rebuilding, it makes you think of an, you know, an organised level and, and, and who, who, what labour force have you got available for that? Um, you know, is it, is it soldiers? It's to do with the defences or, or is, it, is it slaves? Um, but like I say, it's not a wall that's gradually come down. It's come down in a, in a relatively short amount of time. Um, just to show you the, well, Roman Leicester as, as, as we... Uh, um, had some artist impressions done from sites back in the when the high cross was done. It gives you an idea of the um, the rampart. Perhaps this is where one of our boundary walls, or perhaps it represents a, a walls dis, you know not dis, not dissimilar to this. Um, obviously, our site is just a the waterside site is just this corner here, so we perhaps can fill that in in, in some point. Um, <laughs> All right, this was an interesting discovery. I didn't really, well, I found it interesting at the time because it, it's an, an arm that's been dug off the, the canal, the, uh, the west of the canal, you know, the, the river there, um, and it's been filled in. The, the, that area of the, the land that we're looking at, them, them southern areas, were actually a cooperation yard. It's all, always a bit mystery what actually that was. I guess it was to bring in things to the, the city that was needed. I don't know, coal, whatever. Um, but this was a filled in, in wharf, a wharf was built around it. You can even see some tar still on the, the wall. So we found that in one of the evaluation trenches. Um, you can actually see it on, on maps. Uh, that T ship is actually this building, but it extends off the river. And just, you know, it's, uh, we know that the defences were, were intact into the medieval period. They were perhaps being robbed and things, but. Like I say, it was still a landscape beach feature into the 18th century. And if you plot that onto, sorry, it's a bit garish that map, it was a working one. But if you plot it onto, um, that's the wharf where our, our town wall is, it lies directly outside. It just makes me think if you want to dig a wharf and there's a big hole there already, um, you're not going to go somewhere else. So maybe it was a convenient um, place to start. Um, okay. This is really sort of just the, the, the value of watching briefs. Um, I want to focus on this building. This, 
we're calling this one building. We found this, this, this these remains, building 10, building 11, and building 12. You're never quite sure that this is one building until you can link them together, um, which we can't do unless we, we, we see the, the, the areas between. Um, we knew that it was a very high, again, a very high status Roman house. This area that we didn't get to excavate, we had to preserve it in situ, um, is a building or the, the, the room um, with a hypercourse system. Um, so it's a high status Roman house. The dates for it suggest it was after the defences. So it's in the corner of the town. Um, it was built in several phases, um, but it would be nice to link it up um, further towards the road. Note here that this alignment is not on the street grid. This house starts, this building starts lined to the road, but here it's lined to something else. And again, we know it's it's here when the wall's here. My feeling is it's 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 aligned to the wall and, and subsequently to maybe the river. Um, so again, it's giving us information um, about the impact of, of the wall and, and the impact it has on the on the buildings within it. That's a quick, that's a 3D model of the, that hypercourse, the end of that building. The disturbance by the development would only go down to here. So we just, we did some basic recording on this and then preserved it in situ. And then um, we have got, yeah, second to third century day. What this, we know this building did was that it, 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 it post-dated a previous high sub. Um, status building. In fact, there was an opsig floor like you saw in that building earlier on that was chopped by the um, the robber trench for the town um, wall. So again, buildings are getting demolished. The town's being redeveloped, redesigned um, in order to accommodate those defences. Um, like I said, that was preserved in situ. But we did, on one of the coldest days that I can remember, especially because I was just stood still all day um, and not doing much work at all. We did a watching brief on a drainage channel going between the two areas. Watching brief 19. Um, and we picked up, not only did we pick up this wall coming across so we can confirm that it's the same room. And we also found some outdoor reused surfaces made of building material, building tiles, tecula um, in this southern end. I've not got a picture of that. Um, but we also found a link here um, and a very nice, because often we don't know what these rooms look like inside. Um, but on that location, um, we got this rather dull um, and probably common um, painted wall plaster um, lying over the, 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 the wall. The, the robber of the wall is actually here. Um, but on closer investigation, a bit of nibbling off, it came down onto this lighter green painted wall plaster and then I realized uh, that I was by myself I, I, I had to do some work that day um, so I cleaned all that off um, and came up with this rather nice meter meter long half a meter wide corner panel um, of the painted wall panel um, I'm in form I keep calling this uh, I think a fried egg fried egg border I don't know who called it that um, it keeps, keeps making me think of uh, eggshell white. I think that's the paint. It reminds me of the previous um, colour of the, the plaster that came off it. But fantastic survival of, of this, just, 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 just lying there. And again, the, the, the plaster that came off it shows that this building has been redesigned, redecorated. But this internal area, as far as we're thinking so far, is that it depicts a seascape, um, which there are comparisons with in the... Roman Empire. You can't see very well. You can see better here. You can see the, the, the subtle shades of green. This is uh, plankton or, or vegetation. It's got some um, more borders here. Um, it, it was the best it was ever going to be. You can see it's very fragmentary. So we did a lot of recording um, of that in situ. But it's just to highlight the uh, the importance of, I mean, this was the last day I've actually worked on, on that site. So it, there's always something that um, in, in one day that can advance our knowledge. And you can see there that it wasn't long before that that pipe would, um, you know, just take that, take that out. So that was a fantastic bonus um, to be able to to say this, this, this room with the building with the hyper cost, um, you know, we can then reconstruct um, what it looked like inside. 
Okay. Um, area B is a cemetery. Um, another shot of Leicester, just to show you the, 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 the suburb round there. And this is the area we're looking at now, the area of the Blackfriars. Um, this is a cemetery. The borders of the cemetery to the north, we've not really got any evidence except the bodies run out. And there was no ditch, there was no wall. It might have been a hedge. Um, to the west, um, it runs up to the town wall. Um, this is All Saints to the, the south. We know that the bodies continue on the south of All Saints. Um, but this building um, is the only building we've got associated with the burials, and they do respect this building. So this building was there when the burials, uh, you know, when the, the churchyard was um, being used. Um, our first thought was this was the church uh, of St. Clement's, which precedes the Blackfriars, or so we think. Um, I'll speak about the church in a minute. The cemetery, the burials are Christian. They're all buried east west, or I should I should say west east, with the head of the west, feet of the east. Um, that's for when the day of judgment arrives, when people um, uh, rise from the dead, they'll be facing the right way. Um, there's some exceptions in the cemetery you'll see because we've got the mass graves and, and perhaps then and the different alignments there were more practicality of maximising the number of burials in those mass graves. They're all supine, so they're on their backs, and generally the head's facing forward. Um, more work will be done on alignment, but we've generally got two alignments. You've got this alignment here, and you've got a general alignment here, neither of which line up with the church, which is odd. Again, I suspect this alignment fits nicely with this kink in the, the wall, and this alignment with this alignment of the wall. We, we've got to look at that more. Being Christian burials, there's not a great amount of grave goods. Um, the, the, a lot of them have been buried in shrouds. Um, we may get bits and pieces like that. Things might come out in the wash, but, but generally um, not an awful amount of grave goods. Um, so the Blackfriars in this area, um, founded the late 13th century, 1284, continued in use um, until the dissolution 1538. It, it's reputed that documentary sources say there was a apparently quite poor church that preceded it, um, the Church of St. Clement's. And that's mentioned, I think at least once it's mentioned um, in the early 13th century. Um, but we don't really know what the Blackfriars did or what state the St. Clement's Church was in when they did it. Um, whether they came, they utilised the church in that they used it for their church or, or was it a ruin? Did they, they reuse the rabbit, reuse the stone? We don't know. Um, all that we've got left of the church um, is that rubber trench in, from the previous shot. Um, unfortunately, that rubber trench is not associated to any flaws, um, which is you know really important to date in buildings because um, the, the stone can be robbed a long time after the building's gone out of use. The only thing we've got that may come from the church is this collection of uh, stones, which came from the river nearby, from one of the evaluation trenches about two metres down. It's been looked at. It, it does have an ecclesiastical origin. Um, there's not much of it, but it's uh, our, our closest bet at the moment. Uh, and again, if you're going to throw ecclesiastical stone away, I don't think you're going to throw it too far away from where you find it. Um, and, and this was one, from one of the nearest uh, um, evaluation trenches um, to the site of that of that church. But like I said, there's no floor levels on, on, on that that building in the, in the cemetery. Um, it, it may even be associated, it may be a completely different building within the precincts of the, the Blackfriars. It, it may be even be associated to the um, to the wall. It may be that as, as we look at um, sites nearby, we can, we can start um, building up some theories about that. All right, so types of burials, as you probably gathered by now, the, the key thing is the mass burials in this cemetery. Um, on the plan, everything that's sort of red is a mass burial or an individual in a mass burial. Um, the blue triangles are individuals in double burials um, and the 
brown ones are those in single burials. Um, we've got two, you, for those that are already scribbling on their bits of paper, that you can't get 51 double burial individuals in, in a double burials. I, I've noticed that. Um, and again, it's something we'll, we'll refine. There's obviously some, one missing there or one, one added. So um, we'll work that out or I'll blame someone for it. Um, what's the key about these, these burials? That each combination, each type of grave is, we, we have an example of them intercutting with another one. It's notoriously difficult to work out that stratigraphic sequence, that matrix like we saw in, in the building. Um, to build up that is notoriously difficult in, in um, a graveyard where everything looks the same. It's all in a buried soil. There's, you can't see the cuts that they're buried in, but we can build up with it with relationships between some of the graves and where they're buried and with a program of um, radiocarbon dating. Um, mass graves, essentially three plus individuals in a burial. So we've got, I think we've got 48 mass graves altogether um, of anything between three and up to 27 individuals. Um, count so far, 194 adults, 152 non-adults. That's done from dental and skeletal uh, methods. Very difficult to, to um, say how old is someone is after the 46. Um, likewise, uh, the section of the, uh, the skeletons, uh, so far we've got 105 female and 80 male. Um, that's done with uh, uh, um, sex diamorphic elements of the, um, the skull and the pelvis. But again, condition, preservation, the disturbance by other skeletons, disturbance by uh, uh, modern remains um, can get in the way of that. Two areas of excavation um, of the mass graves, some of the mass graves there. Again, not many finds coming from the graves. Christian burials don't, but there was a nice gold ring from the burial soils. We did find a lot from the burial soils. One thing that kept coming up more, you know, more than a coincidence was the number of bone ice skates, um, but the location by the river um, makes that seem, seem reasonable. We did get other finds, copper um, and, and bone pins, perhaps to associate with the, shroud, the shrouds that people were buried in, the occasional coins and maybe some other fastenings. Okay, quick story of two mass, typical mass graves. This is the most common um, uh, that, that's represented where the individuals, this had, I think this is the one with 27 or 21 burials in, um, three or four one. They're very tidy. They've been laid out in, with care. Um, they've been stacked, the body's been stacked and carefully laid out. Um, this burial is cut by this one on a completely different alignment. This is one where we've got a north-south alignment. And this is, it, it became known as our messy um, grave, 3223, where the individuals, 27, I think, in here in total, I may have got them mixed up um, the other way around, but, but a, a significant number thrown in. Some of them prone, so face down. Some of them spread eagled. Um, you know, a, 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 a very different level of respect to these being um, um, buried. Um, uh, right at the bottom, there was just laid three or four, I think, neonates. Um, so there's something going on here. But the key thing with this, as you'll see when I just mentioned the, the carbon 14 dating strategy, is that it's related to that other burial. So there's two events represented there. So there's two um, periods of catastrophe, which gives us a, um, a way into the, the data, really. They're, they're represented on the GIS. Um, I think the red is is children, the blue is is adults. Um, eight adults in the three or four, one and twelve children, um, and and fifteen children and and twelve adults in um, three, two, two, three, um, and a mixture of of females and, and males. Really, it's, it's roughly half and half. Other types of burials. So that's a. I'm just going to, you know, quick, quick overview of what else we've got here because I'm conscious of the time. Um, double burials, that's a typical double burial on top of each other. We've got others, numerous ones where they're side by side. Um, another double burial, this is of an adult female. I mention this because this is one of, well, it was six, but 
um, from about an hour ago, it became seven. Um, so it's hot off the press. It's, it's like a live news stream isn't it, here, um, of African origin. Um, so they're, they're dotted here that here there are the seven in, in fact two of them are buried together um so that's something that, that, that perhaps we'll, we'll follow up with further research you're burying people in a, a busy cemetery you're gonna disturb other burials so there's a lot of um charnel deposits um where you're re-depositing um uh, bits of body parts that are disturbed when you bury someone sometimes they're they're buried deliberately elsewhere Sometimes they're, they're laid to rest again with the, the, the person you're burying. It all gets looked at um, by the osteologist. Um, some other odd phenomenon on the, on the, on the cemetery was this, this, apart from that mass, that messy mass grave we saw, there was this individual, um, a young adult female, um, buried, there is a, a perinate buried uh, just, just between her knees here, but also, um, she's buried with a um, an older, unsexed juvenile person. But why um, she's buried um, on a north-south um, alignment at the time, you know, and buried with with this individual and and this this perinet is uh, perhaps something we'll never um, find out. There's a lot we're not going to find out um, about individual burials. Um, th there are some deviant burials. I don't necessarily think this is this would be classed as deviant burial, though it might do. But we have got a group of burials on the right by the town wall. It's about five meters from the nearest burial. Documentary sources saying you know often give clues to to why people might be treated differently. Um, it could be that criminals were buried away from the main churchyard, or those that died differently, maybe violently, um, unmarried mothers. Um, suicide, so you know, massively different prejudices from today, is it? Um, some of these, depending on, on, on what we feel and, and, and the scope of what we want to look at, might be um, and put forward for, um, for further, certainly for, for C14 dating. Um, so just to draw to the site work to a close, um, this was in these machines, the developer was encroaching upon us. This is us working on the cemetery. And there's actually four machines and they're coming towards us there. So it only remained for us to quickly get rid of the, the evidence in a van. Um, and then, um, which was slightly harder work, get rid of the, the staff um, at the end of, of site. Um, so just to sort of bring things to a close, I thought I'd just, just say what's happening now. Um, because we've been off site for like uh, since June 2019. The first stage, nine months, whatever, of coming off site involved the post X assessment. That's basically thinking about what we've got, what questions we've got, what materials we've got off site, what we've retrieved from site, and what money we've got, and what we're going to spend it on. What, what questions can we reasonably answer? Um, and now we're at the stage where we were doing those tasks. So we're waiting for the ostological report. We're in a few discussions uh, with various uh, agencies of people regarding um, ADNA analysis, whether that's a, a pathogen uh, or ancestry or both, that's ongoing. Um, we'll be doing isotopic um, analysis for certain reasons connected with the site and 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 and, and sort of um extended research i've been working on a radiocarbon uh, phasing strategy to try and to try and tighten up the dates of, of of these events essentially to start with the mass graves and these catas catastrophic events you know um especially the related ones to work out whether they were single events or, or or there were open graves there's a lot of work to be done there there's several PhDs that uh, students that we're working with, um, mainly to do with the cemetery. There's one. Um, there's, a, there's a comparison being done um, with this cemetery, and there's, there's a, a remains from a Lincoln bypass. There's a lot of children from a cemetery in the Lincoln bypass, and they're in a right state with TB, and um, they're not very healthy at all. Um, luckily for us, our children died in a very healthy state because it was very sudden. So it's a fantastic. Um, for, for, for comparison for, for diet and weaning um, and also our adults because um, adults are also just children that, that survive so it, it opens them doors to, to, to that sort of um, that area of research um, 
there's, there's somebody doing a PhD, I think, in, in new approach to mass graves and, and trying to identify and work out the social implications and why people were buried in certain mass graves. That's a, a multidisciplinary approach that's going on. And I heard from someone this week who's interested in, 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 in piecing together um, uh, individuals from channel the deposits. Um, so it's just to show that, that you know, it's, it's, it's an open thing. There's a lot of um, questions that come from, from sites like this. Um, the rest of the site, we're, we're, we're awaiting specialist reports in pottery, environmental, in animal bones, um, in building materials. So that's all going on at the moment. Um, there's one of our project osteologists up in York working on some of the remains. I'm not going to go um, on about the, um, the osteology because it's not my job, but there's a, there's a whole expected amount of, uh, of, of pathologies being represented um, and traumas, degenerative conditions, infectious disease, metabolic uh, disease and, and, and then dental disease. And, and some of that's... Um, you know, coming back is quite rare and quite important. It might be that we focus on, on those things. I've actually got a list from my osteologist today of, of areas she'd like us to, to concentrate on. Um, and so that'll be, that'll be followed up. Um, that's just about the osteology. So just to finish, the radiocarbon dating scheme. This is the dates we've already got on our pilot scheme. Um, 10 burials. Um, we actually did these uh, after we'd only excavated about uh, 200. So it was about midway through the excavation. Um, they basically give us a date um, roughly between 1000 um, and, and 1080. You could perhaps refine that further to 1020 to 1070. Um, a lot of work that I've been doing um, since then has been, again, trying to, to refine the, the relationship between the the remains and 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 and, and uh, 3D modelling of the, the cemetery and the individuals to 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 refine that has been invaluable, um, and that's with the aim of coming up with a, a stratigraphic matrix. This is the skeleton one, um, where you get strands of related burials. So this green block is a mass grave, and how it's represented here means it, like it post dates this mass grave. And we focus our dates, our carbon, radiocarbon um, 14 dates, um, to clarify what's going on there. What we add to our radiocarbon 14 dates, our radiocarbon um, dates, is underlying stratigraphy. Um, and this shot just shows three mass graves. Um, and you can see this one here cuts through this individual. Um, this is just, I'm standing on a concrete plinth, so you can see the damage that it actually does. What's key here um, is what the Fion is leaning on, and this grey area here. All these burials are actually buried on top of a pit. And like I say, we don't have much dating in this cemetery, um, apart from what we get from the radiocarbon dates. Of the, we don't have much stratigraphy. But what we have got here is underlying pits where we've got secure dating, a bit like the pits in the backyard where we can confident that we've got secure dating. And that can tighten up um, any radiocarbon 14 dates that we get. And, and, and we might start be able to, to you know, to, to, to narrow down that 1020 to 1070 um, date. Um, and we might be able to offer some answers. Um, We've no idea how um, accurate, for example, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles are for the 11th century. Um, but in there, um, it, it's strife with, with um, dates for, for famine that, that fall into that period um, and pestilence, obviously not specifying which pestilence. But like I said, we don't know that, but it just goes to show from documentary sources, it might be that we can get clues um, and narrow it down and, and only time will tell. Um, really that's going to happen. Um, so like I say, to summarise, at this stage we're not really necessarily looking for all the answers, but we're still sort of trying to work out the, the questions um, and open to, to more questions, um, perhaps questions that we, we're more able to answer with the material we've got. Um, and so we, we're still doing things in stages. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and working out which questions we can answer with the the, the, the material remains and 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 to be uh, to be frank and the money we've got um 
is always a consideration on commercial archaeology. Um, and it'll keep a site of this scale in all areas from the medieval from the Roman remains to the, the medieval remains, the tannery to the you know, the cemetery. We'll always keep creating uh, you know questions. It's not going to be we're not going to answer them all. We're not going to get all the questions while I'm working on it, and I may be in the grave itself by the the time that the questions are still coming. Um, and that's going to involve a lot of um, other people. Um, academics, um, specialists, uh, and archaeologists, and perhaps in the future, some of their answers or theories may form, uh, you know, further further presentations. And that's about it, really. So, I shall pass you back to uh, your uh, host. Thanks, Steve. That was a fantastic talk. So if anyone's got any questions for Steve, if you'd like to type them into the chat box and we'll, we'll spend at least 15 minutes on them if Steve's happy to. So we've already got some questions, Steve. Um, actually, while I find the beginning first one, um, I've got a question. Um, the Roman building in area A, mm. the clay internal wall, did you see any evidence that that was a clay bricks or was it just solid clay? No, it was solid clay succinct answer yeah. <laughs> a, a, i mean i think the blue boy lane must still be the f only one where we've really seen evidence of yeah no we were we, we, our eyes were open to that yeah. having having tony on site we, we were um, <laughs> yeah we were we were pretty up onto that um okay so chris asks um in reference to the extramural area any sign of post medieval suburb and or civil war defenses no civil war there was a few false alarms where we thought we maybe that maybe have some civil war um and, and features um and some of these buildings that we've got in that area um the, the lifespan of them did extend into the uh, the post medieval period um but a lot of that um where where those buildings didn't continue it had been destroyed by by the the recent truncations really was there any evidence that there was like a mass demolition of the buildings? That... We didn't get any any evidence that that was widespread. No. no so. um, Sam asks, how do you preserve in situ? It depends what you're preserving in situ. Um, it's not that complicated, if I can use the example there, that building, because it's it's been there for 2,000 years. It's preserved itself quite well. Um, again, it, it's, 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 it's under immediate threat. Um, a building like that, it, it, it's 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 solid, it's substantial, it's made of granite, essentially. Um, it's under immediate threat from the developer. So the first way we preserve it in situ is is get the developer to not disturb it, um, and that that's working with architects and 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 with plans. Um, but something like that, we would just cover it up. Um, the buffer zone is put above it. It's covered with like another material, perhaps sand, to give like developers would do with drainage to to warn anyone that's going to be there. But it's it's located. Uh, we know exactly where it is. We know exactly what depth it is. Um, so that sort of waves the red flag if any further development is going to be going to happen. So in the case of that that quite substantial um, structure, that's essentially how how we do it. And an assessment would be made for for any more sensitive materials. Um, and, 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 a, and a plan of how to to do that with certain specialists in, in you know and and material specialists to to do that. And then, as a follow up to that, Sam asks: um, When you come across something like that seascape wall plaster, how do you decide decide whether to carry on excavating? Um, how do you know when to um, whether you need to extend or or, or not? Well. Um, the the only part of that seascape wall plaster that was under threat was the bit that that's contained within the 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 excavation that fits that piping. So essentially, the, any extended either side of that is not under threat from the developer. So we don't we don't follow it. The only reason we would follow something um, is if it was a, a specific sort of uh, interpretive value. If we found a burial there, I mean, the reason we were doing that was also, also to keep an eye out for burials. You know, if, if just the legs of a, an individual were in that trench, 
um, just to remove someone's legs as ethical reasons to that, we would have a remit therefore to, to follow because uh, a, a human, the, the, the remains of a body is itself an entirety. So we would have a remit to, to, but we have to stop somewhere and that's agreed with, with the developers, whatever they are going to damage or destroy, they have to pay. Um, it's sort of unfair to ask them to pay for uh, much more than that, unless there's a special reason really. Okay, so Christopher asks, were there any unexpected post-medieval finds or features? Post-medieval? No, not really. Um, outside the town, not really. Like I said, a lot of the buildings we've excavated, their lifespan does stretch into that, that period. Um, but again, there's a lot of work going on. Um, we, we have got features of post-medieval date. Um, they don't form a narrative like the, the early ones do at the moment, but there's always time for that when we look more closely at the pottery um, and, and at the plans um, and see how things fit together. That That's certainly a, um, the post-medieval phase will be it will be treated exactly as the other ones. There's certainly less post-medieval um, remains, tangible remains, but, but they will be subject to the same analysis, really. Um, okay, so Barry asks, where are the remains reburied? Or will they um, be because, reburied well, because they're Christian, um, or the ones in the cemetery, because um, we have got some Roman ones, um, isolated ones elsewhere, um, that I didn't cover today, but um, essentially they will be buried on consecrated ground. Um, I think in the past set excavations in Leicester, we've done it at the cemetery up at Gilrose. Yeah, so my bet would be that they go there, but, but if they don't go there, um, they'll go to other consecrated grounds. It might be that we apply um, to keep some uh, as a research collection, but that's a whole different um, decision and process to go through and, and one we have to justify. Sort of thing. Um, okay, so a question about the river from Jane. Did the river keep the same course during this period? Well, yeah, I knew someone mentioned that. Well, it was at one of our um, early research aims, because we don't really know. Um, what, what we did find out, the research aims get shifted around as well in, in, in levels of priority, um, unfortunately. We did some limited work watching... Um, there's lots of stuff going on on uh, building sites and, and they need to know what's under the ground. It's not just us because they're building on it. Um, they want to know it's not going to fall down. So we watched a lot of geotechnical um, excavations and, and we tried to sort of stick our nose in and take some measurements. Um, and we did get an idea of where the river gravels were um, moving across. If you remember that slide right at the start, moving across from east to west. And it did seem that we picked up... Um, you know, a slope in the a gradient in the in the, in the middle of that green. So, in answer to your question, it was there or thereabouts. I don't think it it was somewhere that was going to have a major impact uh, in, in in Leicester. So, yeah, it was there or thereabouts, and a lot of that green area as well um, had evidence, particularly the the west the western half of it. Um, we got evidence for a lot of alluvium being built up, and alluvium is is material that's deposited by rivers. So, it was near enough there to 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 leave deposits when it was in flood. Okay, so going back to the mass graves, Kaylee asks, could the people in the mass graves be victims of the Norman conquest? So is there any evidence of violence? Well, you, yeah, very good question. And then one I should have mentioned, no, we've, apart from the, the odd, you know, fracture here that you would find and, 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 and bump here that you would find in a nutritional uh, you know people in day-to-day -day life there's no evidence that any people in the mass graves were subject to a particularly uh, more violent death than, than than anyone else so it's something we ruled out quite quite early on we, we know it's a catastrophe but i think we've ruled out that it's 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 um um any form of violence at least any form of violence that that, that leaves a, a mark on the skeletal remains. Ian says he loves your archaeological perspective on mortality. Adults are just children who survive. So, so. 
<laughs> that's actually our osteologist's uh, 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 take on, on. But it's very true, really, for research purposes. It's uh, it's certainly um, got people interested, really. Uh, Clive asks, did you actually lift that wall plaster? Yeah. Um, in very many pieces, uh, sadly. It was quite a, a depressing thing to do all by myself on a wet day. Um, and like I said, the best record of that wall plaster was what we got on the day, uh, an awful lot of photographs. Um, I, I made some um, three-dimensional models um, by patching photographs together. So we've got a fantastic record of it. Um, and, and unfortunately, it's something that, you know, it's, it's virtually impossible to, to recreate it to, to that state again. But um, again, we're there, we're there to make the best record possible um, in the conditions that we, we, we're afforded to do that. So, um, and it might be that we can reconstruct. I mean, there's a lot of um, comparisons that can be, can be made. So hopefully we can start um, using our imagination a little bit. It won't be, at least it won't be too far-fetched now. It's, it's rather than having nowhere to start, some, something like that's uh, invaluable for having a starting point and, and it's not unreasonable to... Um, to recreate a whole wall. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, okay. So, uh, hang on. Bear with me for this one. That's okay. Right. So, this question it's about the cemetery again. So, um, the number of mass graves in the cemetery might be seen as relating to exceptional events. So, accepting that those are exceptional events. But this person wonders. Um, the ratio of double burials to single burials seems less affected by exceptional events. How does that ratio, the ratio of double burials to single burials, um, compare to other excavated medieval cemeteries? Well, again, that that is for the future, really, and it's something that the, uh, the whole spatial idea of that cemetery, so um, where the graves are, where the double graves are, um, where the, the single graves are, where the mass graves are, they're all they're all giving us different questions. What we haven't, what I'm loath to do too soon is, is focus on the spatial aspects of the cemetery um, and, and and where all these graves are. Namely, because we haven't got the whole cemetery yet. Um, but on the other side of the road, coming out from the other side of the road on a, on a site we've not not. Um, analyze it or, or not even assessed we do have other burials that um, invariably part of that church so so when we've patched all these things together certainly the, the, the spatial distribution of the the the, um, the double burials and perhaps a further program of of, of dating um, will be looked at but until then until we, we're still in the process of getting all that information together um, and like I say, there's going to be so many questions, but, but invariably they will focus on these types of burials and, and comparisons with, with, with other burials um, and other cemeteries um, and other instances of, of, of that type of, of, of grave. Because, you know, the double grave is in itself a, um, an interesting grave type. I mean, also we've, got a, we've even got to look further at the double graves because at the moment I've just counted double graves, which is reasonable on site as graves containing two people. Um, but quite a high proportion of those graves um, uh, contain an adult and a child. They might be completely different graves or, or, or completely different grave types to, 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 to a double grave with two, two um, adults. So again, it's, it's information there. It'll all be on the database. It'll all be on GIS models. We can, we can separate and look at different patterns and, and hopefully um, do some research into, into that sort of question. Definitely going to be interesting to compare with the southern burials when they when they're looked at, isn't it? Assuming that the All Saints Road does have the church underneath it, your burials are to the north of of the church, and those are to the south. It's different Absolutely. burial areas. Yeah, I mean, I am just conscious that at the moment I'm looking at a third of the cemetery, and I've got to wait and 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 see if I can look at you know them burials which probably gives us two thirds and anything spatial anything to do with grave types and distribution of them and relation of them to each other is going to um, hold a lot more water at that point i think you know the double burials i mean you do seem to have quite a lot though don't you i mean i don't st peter's I, th I think we only in the 1300 burials we had there i think maybe we only had six double burials so yeah um, it certainly seems different 
no, absolutely. Again, and also you've got that combination of into you know we've got we've got double burials cutting mass graves. We've got mass graves cutting double burials. We've got yeah. du- single burials cutting double graves, and every combination. So it's going to take some picking apart. But hopefully, um, when we've got a lot of information. Um, we, we can start isolating it and, and, and picking and choosing what we see and some pattern perhaps will, will, will emerge. Okay, so we've got two more questions and then we'll, we'll draw it to an end. So Stephen asks, what prompted the Romans to build defences? Well, that's, about, that's a big question. In fact, Matt, you could probably answer that better than I could, sort of thing. <laughs> um, well, I guess it reflects... It could reflect a lot of things. It could reflect, uh, you know, political things, what's going on in in in, in surround in the empire. Um, it could be a status thing. Um, you know, it's uh, redesigned the town. It's it's you know, it's a it's perhaps a wider question. Um, you'd think really so. I mean, certainly, the the empire does become internally does become more unstable in the later empire, which might decide that towns want defences. Mm. But there's another possibility: is it's to control access to the town in terms of trade and taxation. Yeah. Uh, but Steve is right when he said it must have been a major impact. I mean, everywhere else we've seen, in outside the town, in the extramural areas. As soon as the defences are built, everything ceases. Um, all activity ceases as if, so there's no suburbs effectively after the, the walls are built and to the south, certainly, and in other places to the north. Yeah. So it, it would have had a, a really profound effect on the town, I think. Before the defences were built, it would have looked, it would have been very open and outward looking into the countryside. And after the, they, they were built, it would look mm-hmm. in completely inwards. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, so final question from Jill. Oh, I've lost it. Is the relationship between archaeologists and developers generally better and more productive now than in the past? Oh, that's a... (laughs) Tactful answer, I feel. Well, no, absolutely. I mean, in all honesty, um, it it probably varies from developer to developer. It probably, in all honesty, develops between... It varies between archaeologist and archaeologist. Um, certainly, in my experience, we're talking about Waterside. Um, the, the main developer we worked with, because of the, the, the stage we were working there, the bulk of the stage was the, the, the demolition um, contractors. Um, and, and, and we wouldn't have got the job done as efficiently if it wasn't for them. Um, because, I, I mean... I, we were lucky that we, we, we met people and we're working with people that had a, a like mindset in that, you know, if you're working with someone else, you can, you can either let them get on with it and show no interest, let them get on with it, not, not get in their way or anything and, and they'll get on with it. As happens with developers, when you're working with someone, you can get in the way, you can get be annoyed that they're there. Um, that's not as advantageous to getting the, the job done, but there is a third way where you can actively help each other um in any way possible and uh, unfortunately um we, we certainly had that that relationship on this site where um they they worked closely with us and, and helping us um and, and as a and as a result we, we did likewise um and and that got the, the the job done a massive job done i guess that's not true for every site and and, and there's probably a different story on different sites so whether it's uh, any better than it was in the past, um, personally, I, I'd, I'd, I'd still question. Really, I'd, I wouldn't. In my experience, there it was, but maybe other people have got a different opinion. I guess we're more accepted by the developers these days, although possibly still seen as an inconvenience. Still, but but an accepted yeah. inconvenience but, rather but than just an inconvenience. We, on Waterside, we were certainly an inconvenience. We're an inconvenience to any. Um, developer but if that developer thinks they've got their head screwed on and think they're an inconvenience how can I get rid of them the quickest I can and the quickest way to get rid of them is help them I think yeah so and 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 then they get the job done quicker and better yeah well thank you Steve that was an excellent talk